This is the paper Signals by Brian Skirms. He presented it as his address to the Philosophy of Science Association in 2006 when he was the association's president. The address was published in the journal of the association a few years later, and the book it was based on came out in 2010. Skirms is a colleague of mine now in the Department of Logic and Philosophy of Science at the University of California, Irvine. He's one of only two current living philosophers, the other being Alan Gibbard, who has been elected as a fellow of the National Academy of Sciences. Over several decades, he's done influential work in many different areas of mathematical philosophy. His early work from the 1960s and 70s is on a variety of topics, inductive logic, necessity and possibility, causation, objectivity in science, the meaning of the conditional phrase, if then, rational ways to respond to evidence. By the 1980s, he had come to focus on a lot of work in causal decision theory, but starting in the 1990s and in the decades since, most of his work has been on various topics in evolutionary game theory and how it can be used to explain many biological and social phenomena. This paper is specifically about the origins of language, though, as you'll see, it's just as relevant to any number of other signaling systems, both in society and in nature, including ones much simpler than human language, as well as ones related to or unrelated to it. So decision theory is the theory of strategy when one person is making a choice between several actions whose outcomes will depend on some unknown state of nature. Game theory, by contrast, is the theory of strategy when multiple people are making choices between several actions whose outcomes will depend on what everyone decides as well as the unknown state of nature. Both of these topics, decision theory and game theory, are widely studied in economics and philosophy as well as many other fields like political science, business, psychology, sociology, etc. Usually, decision theory and game theory are studied in contexts where we assume that everyone involved is perfectly rational and has full capacity to reason about what all the possibilities are and also to reason about what everyone else is doing, which involves reasoning about everyone else reasoning about them and so on. This can be useful if you're trying to help expert chess players in their games against each other, or if you're imagining wealthy corporations and major governments that are both dedicating large amounts of resources to trying to figure out what's the best way that they can cooperate or compete with each other to achieve their different objectives. Of course, this sort of extreme rationality assumption is unrealistic for understanding the decisions of ordinary people in ordinary circumstances who are going to be imperfect reasoners affected by their emotions, deciding quickly, and so on. The field of behavioral economics is the study of this sort of uh, ordinary decision that proceeds empirically by seeing how people behave in certain games and decisions. Now, evolutionary game theory is a third approach to this. Uh, instead of assuming perfect rationality, we do the opposite. Uh, instead of assuming infinitely logical and perfectly rational agents who are playing games with each other, we instead assume incredibly simple agents interacting in ways that don't even need any understanding and don't require any thoughts about what each other is doing or even about the environment. So we can think of maybe there are two bacteria species that live in the same environmental niche and their strategies, which we don't have to think of them imagining as strategies at all, might involve producing or not producing various chemicals. And those chemicals might interact in ways that make it easier or harder for each other to survive when one or both or none are present. Uh, and perhaps producing the chemicals is costly. But if there's a big enough benefit from both species secreting their separate chemicals, then we might imagine that maybe they'll both evolve to produce the chemical in just the same way that rational humans might learn to cooperate with each other that just the same way is perhaps uh, tendentious, but it's one of the questions that we're interested in in environmental and evolutionary game theory is thinking, how much intelligence or learning do you need to assume in order to achieve certain kinds of cooperation? We don't have to think that bacteria learn. We just have to think that the bacteria with one behavior are more likely to reproduce than those with another, and their behavior is likely to be inherited. And then in the long run, the community is going to have some mix of behaviors that act as if there was intelligent cooperation. 
While we don't think that human learning is this low in thinking or rationality, many behaviorists in the field of psychology uh, have suggested that it's still a useful model to consider to just imagine the input and output interactions of the humans without assuming anything about what's going on inside their heads. And this may be a good way to explain a lot of the behaviors that we have. So when you're walking down a crowded sidewalk and you see someone coming towards you, you're going to dodge to one side or the other. It appears that in different cultures, people have a habit of either everyone dodges to the right or everyone dodges to the left. Uh, and this might be learned subconsciously. Most of us don't even know what we do in our own uh, culture, but we've just subtly, subconsciously picked up on what's the interaction that makes things work up. We've learned when to say thank you, when you're supposed to greet random strangers and when you're supposed to ignore them. And all of these things seem like the kinds of things that we learn perhaps through just reinforcement, not through any conscious thought. Perhaps we just tend to increase our performance of actions where something ended up going well and decrease the actions where things ended up going badly. And as a result, we end up converging on some sort of social pattern of interactions without having to explicitly think about it or to think about what anyone else is doing explicitly at all. The idea of this paper, which is worked out in greater detail in the book, is that by studying this kind of very simple system, we might be able to explain how apparently unintelligent bacteria, plants, and animals can end up sending signals to each other. And maybe we can explain how it is that ancient humans came to have signaling systems that gave rise to language. And maybe we can even come to understand how modern humans learn to cooperate in situations where we don't share a common language or anything like that. Okay, so let's begin. So he begins with this quote from Adam Smith. Two savages who had never been taught to speak, but had been brought up remote from the societies of men, would naturally begin to form that language by which they would endeavor to make their mutual wants intelligible to each other. What is the origin of signaling systems? Adam Smith suggests that there is nothing mysterious about it. Two perfectly ordinary people who did not have a signaling system would naturally invent one. In the first century BC, Vitruvius says much the same thing. In that time of men, when utterance of a sound was purely individual, from daily habits, they fixed on articulate words just as they happened to come. Then, from indicating by name things in common use, the result was, in this chance way, they began to talk, and thus originated conversation with one another. Vitruvius is echoing the view of the great atomist, Democritus, who lived four centuries earlier. Footnote, Vitruvius in the 10 books of architecture, book two, chapter one. Another echo is to be found in Diodorus of Sic Sicily. The sounds they made had no sense and were confused, but gradually they articulated their expressions and by establishing symbols among themselves for every sort of object, they came to express themselves on all manners in a way intelligible to one another. Such groups came into existence throughout the inhabited world, and not all men had the same language, since each group organized their expressions as chance had it. Translated from Barnes, see also Verlinsky and the passage on Democritus from Proclus's commentary on the Cratylus in Barnes 2001. Okay, so the big question Skirms is going to ask, can it be true? And if so, how can it be true? And when he says it, he means the idea that uh, humans started out without a signaling system, they made sounds while interacting with each other in the presence of objects, and then they came to agree on certain sounds standing for certain objects. So the leading alternative view, that is the alternative to this idea that sounds came to have meanings by chance and uh, eventual formation of a convention, was that some signals, at least originally, had their meaning by nature. That is, that there was an innate signaling system. Footnote two, I am of necessity oversimplifying the ancient debate here. And you see this idea in various stories about ancient kings who ordered that someone raise a child without hearing anyone around them speak to see what language the kid ends up speaking 
And various ancients claim, oh, this child ended up speaking Hebrew, so therefore Hebrew must be the, na the natural language of humans. Some of them said it was Greek, some of them said it was Persian. Uh, it seems very unlikely that any of them actually uh, uh, were getting at the truth here. But at the time, Skirm says, this may have seemed like an acceptable explanation, the idea that there was some innate language. But after Darwin, we must say that it is no explanation at all. That is, just saying that something is innate doesn't explain how it came to be innate. As Skirm says, bare postulation of an evolutionary miracle is no more explanatory than postulation of a miraculous in invention. Either way, some work needs to be done. That is, Skirms is suggesting, we can either imagine that humans invented language through conscious learning, or we could say that humans naturally got language through evolution. But either way, we have to explain how did that learning happen or how did the evolution happen? And he's going to propose a single story that's going to explain how either one of these could work, though it'll be subtly different for the two. So he says, whatever one thinks of human signals, it must be acknowledged that information is transmitted by signaling systems at all levels of biological organization. Monkeys, birds, bees, and even bacteria have signaling systems. He's not going to go into a lot of the details here, but the idea is that various monkeys have warning calls that they make when certain kinds of predators are coming. Different birds have special kinds of songs that they sing when they're trying to communicate certain either territorial or mating or other sorts of things to each other. Bees have a certain dance that they do to point others in their hive to where the honey or where the nectar is coming from. Bacteria secrete chemicals that interact with each other to let them know when there's enough present that they can take over the host or something like that. He says, multicellular organisms are only possible because internal signals coordinate the actions of their constituents. That is, the different glands secrete hormones that tell other organs when to produce certain things that they need to do. And somehow these signaling systems are coordinated in a way that makes complex organisms possible. And these are signaling systems, it seems, that there's some information that is present to one part of the organism that needs to get to another part of the organism in order for it to know when to do its job. But we don't have to think of the organs knowing anything. Some of these signaling systems are innate in the strongest sense. We have now not one, but two questions. How can interacting individuals spontaneously learn to signal and how can species spontaneously evolve signaling systems? I would like to indicate how we can bring contemporary theoretical tools to bear on these questions. Okay, section one, sender and receiver. In 1969, David Lewis framed the problem in a clean and simple way by introducing sender-receiver games. Before I go on, David Lewis is probably someone whose name you've encountered in many different areas of philosophy, uh, but here, Skirms is referring to his PhD dissertation, uh, which is specifically about this question, how do conventional representations arise? That is, the word dog is no more connected to a certain kind of animal than the word chien or the word hund. And yet in different languages, people come to agree, we will use this word for this animal and people in a different community use a different word for the same animal. And he's interested in the question, how is it that these initially meaningless words come to be attached to particular meanings? So Lewis's sender-receiver games work in this way. There are two players, the sender and the receiver. Nature chooses a state at random and the sender observes the state chosen. The sender then sends a signal to the receiver who cannot observe the state directly, but does observe the signal. The receiver then chooses an act, the outcome of which affects them both, with the payoff depending on the state. Both have pure common interest, they get the same payoff, and there is exactly one correct act for each state. In the correct act-state combination, they both get positive payoff, otherwise payoff is zero. Lewis discusses only the case in which there are as many acts as there are states, 
and as many signals as there are states and acts, and this is where we will begin. All right, before I go on, I'll just talk this through a little bit more with some examples. So here's a simple toy example. So imagine that you and I are on a game show and you are presented with two boxes. You can either take the left box or the right box. And we're both going to share what's in whichever box you pick. But the catch is you can't see what's in the boxes. However, I'm in the other room and I've got a camera so I can see what's in the boxes. And I see that one of the boxes contains $1,000 and the other one contains nothing. But I'm not allowed to talk to you. Now, there is something I can do. The one thing I can do is that in my room, I've got two buttons. One of them lights up a red light and the other one lights up a blue light. And you can see which light gets lit up. And the game show is going to give us a chance to do this 10 times in a row with a new pair of boxes where I see what's in it, you don't see what's in it, you pick one I, uh, after seeing my signal, and we both share what's in the box. And let's think about what we imagine would happen. Well, presumably the idea is we will try to figure out some way for my signal of blue or red to indicate to you whether you should pick the left box or the right box. But we haven't had a chance to talk about this yet. So on the first time, probably we'll look, I will push one of the buttons and you will uh, uh, guess one of the boxes and see if we got it right. If we got it right, we're probably going to try to decide that, okay, we figured it out this time. So if I pushed red when it was in the left box, then maybe we'll agree red means left box and blue means right box. But if we got it wrong, we might both try to adjust our behavior to try to converge. If we have 10 chances in a row, we'll probably eventually converge and then start getting the prize every time. But for the first few guesses, we might be a little bit confused. And so this is the basic idea of this Lewis Skirm signaling game. Now in this toy example with this game show, it's entirely artificial, but that presents things in a very clear cut way. However, one of the interesting points is this same sort of system is going to arise all the time in real world biology, as well as perhaps actual social interactions between humans. So here's one uh, slightly more complex version that may be something that arises in nature. So let's consider a lichen. This is a symbiotic organization of an algae and a fungus that both live together on a surface. And it turns out each of them can only survive if the other is present. The fungus can sort of break open the rocks that they live on and get certain minerals out, while the algae can then use those minerals and some water from the environment and uh, carbon dioxide from the atmosphere to create energy that they can both use. And maybe we can imagine a situation where there's some feature that the fungus can sense, but that the algae has to respond to. Perhaps the fungus can sense when local water levels are running low and the algae needs to shift into a conservation mode so it doesn't use up all the water before it runs out. And maybe one way this can happen is that perhaps the fungus can secrete two chemicals and the algae's growth might be sensitive to the presence or absence of one or the other of these chemicals. So one possibility is that the fungus secretes chemical A when water is running low and chemical B when water is abundant, or we could imagine the fungus secretes chemical B when water is running low and A when it's abundant and the algae could go into conservation mode when it detects chemical A and growth mode when it detects chemical B, or it could go into conservation mode when it detects chemical B and growth mode when it detects chemical A. And now both of them are going to do well if the algae goes into growth mode when water is abundant and conservation mode when the water is running low, and both will do badly if the algae does the opposite. There's nothing intrinsic to the signals A and B that mean one of them stands for water running low and one of them standing for water abundant. But if the fungus and algae happen to uh, coincidentally use the signal in the same way, then they'll reproduce well. And if they happen to use it in different ways, then they'll die off. And so in the long run, the algae and the fungus will converge on some particular signaling system. Either A means uh, low water and B means abundant water or vice versa. And uh, we can also have other examples where uh, 
the state of nature that's involved is not some external thing, but perhaps some internal thing to one of the organisms. Consider the interactions of a fruit tree and a monkey. The fruit can either be ripe or unripe. And if the fruit is ripe, then it's good for both the monkey and the tree if the monkey eats the fruit. The monkey gets a good meal and the tree gets its seeds dispersed uh, around uh, another place. But it's no good if the monkey doesn't eat it when it's ripe. However, if the fruit is unripe, then uh, it's good for both the monkey and the tree if they leave, if the monkey leaves the fruit there to develop. Uh, and it's bad for both the monkey and the tree if the monkey eats it, because if it's unripe, then the seeds won't develop and the monkey won't get a good meal. And so trees learn in some evolutionary sense to send signals to the monkeys about when their fruit is ripe. And the way this normally works is that the trees signal using their color. There's nothing inherent in the color red or the color green that makes one of them a good signal for ripeness and the other for unripeness. But the tree learns over time that it's Unripe fruit should be one color and its ripe fruit should be the other color. And the monkey learns to eat fruit of the one color and not of the other color. And uh, uh, in this case, there's probably many different plant species that are all trying to signal to the monkey in the same way. And so if one of them starts successfully signaling, red means ripe and green means unripe, the monkey is going to learn that signal. And now other trees are going to have to learn to signal in the same way to get the attention of the monkeys. Now, in this case, the monkey might actually be learning. We could imagine a monkey being dropped into a new environment, and it discovers that the trees here are a different color when they're ripe. And it might learn this new color, whereas the tree probably isn't learning, it's probably evolving. So these are some examples of how this sort of signaling game might go. That there's two entities that are interacting, one of them has access to some fact that both of them care about, the other one can do something whose value to both of them depends on that fact. And there's a way for the one who's aware of the fact to send a signal to the other one. And there are two signals they can send. There's no inherent connection between the signal and the fact, but the two are going to gradually learn to associate one of the signals with one of the states and one of the acts. And uh, even though at the beginning, there is no meaning to any of these completely arbitrary signals. By the end of this process, they're going to get some meaning. And so here's where, how Skirm says that. Signals are not endowed with any intrinsic meaning. If they are to acquire meaning, the players must somehow find their way to an equilibrium where information is transmitted. When transmission is perfect so that the act always matches the state, that is the monkey always eats the ripe fruit and never eats the unripe fruit, or uh, you always grab the box that has $1,000 in it and never grab the box that has nothing in it, or the algae always goes into growth mode when there's abundant water and always goes into conservation mode when there's no water. Uh, when transmission is perfect in this way, Lewis calls the equilibrium a signaling system. It is a virtue of Lewis's formulation that we do not have to endow the sender and receiver with a pre-existing mental language in order to define a signaling system. So we don't have to say that the tree learns that red means ripe and green means unripe, or even that the monkey learns that red means ripe and green means unripe. It's just that the tree comes to be such that it makes its ripe fruits red, and the monkey comes to be such that it eats red fruits and not green fruits. And then in the end, the upshot is that the monkey will eat the ripe fruits and not eat the unripe fruits. It could have worked just as well if the colors had been reversed, but it did work out this way. So if we start with a pair of sender and receiver strategies and switch the messages around the same way in both, we get the same payoffs. So that is, uh, if we imagine a world where instead of making green, uh, unripe fruits green and ripe fruits red, and instead of monkeys eating red fruits and leaving green fruits, we have a world where trees make ripe fruits green and unripe fruits red, and monkeys eat green fruits and not red fruits, then they get the same payoffs. They both succeed in either way. It doesn't matter which association of signal to state was the case. 
permutation of messages takes one signaling system equilibrium into another. This fundamental symmetry is what makes Lewis signaling games a model in which the meaning of signals is purely conventional. That is, there's no intrinsic fact that makes red mean ripe and green mean unripe. It's just a convention that they happen to settle on this, which they could have settled the other way. Just like it's a convention that in the United States, we drive on the right side of the road, while in Britain, they drive on the left side of the road. The roads can work equally well either way. Uh, and it's just, we have to choose one and stick to it. And now he's in his footnote, he says, some signaling interactions may not have this strong symmetry. And then signals may not be perfectly conventional. There may be some natural salience for a particular signaling system. Here we are addressing the worst case for the spontaneous emergence of signaling. So as an example, maybe in the game show, uh, the buttons that I push don't turn on a red light and a blue light. Instead, maybe they turn on the left light and the right light. And if that's going on, then probably what we would do is we would just start with me using the left light if the left box contains the money and the right light if the right box contains the money. We would just sort of, that would be a salient signaling system to us. And we would start with that rather than just guessing at random. Uh, but even if we just start guessing at random, we'll still probably end up converging to a solution. And uh, similarly, maybe the same is true for the monkeys and the fruits and so on that uh, uh, that trees automatically make all sorts of things green as they're growing. And redness is a thing that they have to sort of work extra special to make occur in some place. And so it's natural that the fruit might start out green as it's developing and only get to some other color when it becomes ripe. And so it might be more common, more likely for them to end up signaling red means ripe and green means unripe than the other way around. But Lewis and Skirms are pointing out that uh, if there is some natural connection between the signals and the states, then it's going to be very easy and unsurprising if the beings involved manage to converge on that association. The interesting thing is it's still possible for ordinary people interacting or monkeys and trees interacting or even completely unthinking algae and mosses and uh, and fungus interacting to end up converging on a solution even in the case where there's no meaningful connection pre-existing between the signal and the state it also raises in stark form a question that bothered some philosophers from ancient times onward there seems to be no sufficient reason why one signaling system rather than another should evolve so this is a point that Skirms is going to come back to at a few places later on, that some philosophers have thought everything that happens needs to have a reason to happen. This is what's sometimes called the principle of sufficient reason. And in this case, there's no reason why red should mean left and blue should mean right, rather than red meaning right and blue meaning left. And uh, if there's no reason why one should emerge rather than the other, then some philosophers were worried, well, how is it even possible that it could end up one way rather than the other? And what Lewis and Skirms are going to try to show is that even though the situation is symmetrical, this symmetry ends up in practice just getting broken by some features of the history. It just matters which one did someone do first that happened to work out, and then we'll just keep doing the thing that happened to work. And it could have gone just as well the other way. It just did go this way. Okay, section two, information in signals. Signals carry information. And his footnote says, I follow Dretzky in taking the transmission of information as one of the fundamental issues of epistemology. The natural way to measure the information in a signal is to measure the extent that the use of that particular signal changes probabilities. So that is, we can imagine that uh, uh, maybe if you're uh, a fungus and an algae, uh, initially, there's just some chance that the water is abundant and some chance that the water is low. And maybe the fungus is just sometimes randomly producing certain chemicals and randomly not producing others. And then what's going on is that at a certain point, 
there starts to be a probabilistic association where the fungus is more likely to produce one chemical when there's water and more likely to produce the other chemical when there's no water. And uh, we can measure how much information does the chemical carry about the presence of water by seeing how much does the probability of water being present get affected by the, uh, by the presence of uh, the chemical or not. And uh, in this footnote, he says, we can measure this uh, correlation and probabilities in a principled way using the discrimination information of Kobach and Leibler. So some of you may be familiar with this sort of mathematics of probability theory and the idea of what's called the kobach leibler divergence. And if you are familiar with that, then that gives you a very precise measure of information. But if you're not, it's not essential here. All he's saying is that we don't just have to think of information as binary, yes or no. It's not just at the end of the process, once we've agreed that I will always push the red button when the uh, money's in the left and blue when the money's in the right, uh, that the signal contains information. Early on, when you and I are sort of guessing about what the other person is thinking, it might still be the case that there's some amount of information contained in which button I press. And so he says, accordingly, there are two kinds of information in the signals in the Lewis sender receiver games. Information about what state the sender has observed and information about what act the receiver will take. Uh, the first kind of information measures effectiveness of the sender's use of signals to discriminate states. The second kind measures the effectiveness of the sing signal in changing the receiver's probability of actions. And in the footnote, he says, corresponding to these two types of information, we can talk about two types of content of a signal. And he uh, cites Russell, Ruth Milliken, and Harms. And uh, the idea is that the signal is meant to link this state of the world, maybe the presence or absence of water, or the ripeness or unripeness of the fruit, or the presence of the money in the left or the right, with the behavior of the other person, the algae going into growth mode or conservation mode, the monkey eating the fruit or not, and you uh, taking the left box or the right box. And the idea is that uh, the presence of the signal may give me some information about what uh, the other person observed, and it may give the sender some way of controlling the probabilities of the uh, receiver doing certain actions. And these correspond to uh, uh, information as in terms of both the producers of that information and the consumers of that information, if you're familiar with Milliken's work. So both kinds of information are maximal in a signaling system equilibrium. So remember what he means by a signaling system equilibrium is one in which I always use red for left and always use blue for right or vice versa. And uh, you always do the corresponding picking of the box uh, and there are other states that we could be in. It could be that we haven't yet converged and 90% of the time I push the red when it's in the left and blue when it's in the right, but 10% of the time I do the opposite. And maybe 80% of the time you pick the right box when uh, the light is red and the left box when the uh, light is blue, but 20% of the time you do the opposite. In that case, we're not yet in the signaling system equilibrium. We could get better at uh, coordinating our signals. Both kinds of information can also be maximal in a state in which the players miscoordinate and the receiver always does an act that is wrong for the state. In such a state, there's plenty of information of both kinds, but we would like to say that no information is transmitted or better that misinformation is transmitted. So this would be the case if maybe I will always push the red button if the uh, money's in the left box and the blue button if the money's in the right box but you will always take the right box if the, if the light is red and the blue box and the left box if the light is blue. In that case, maybe you are interpreting the signal in one way and I am interpreting the signal in the opposite way. And we are 100% interpreting the signal this way. And then it's conveying misinformation or 100% diametrically opposed information, but it's maximal information just not being used effectively. And so he says, to 
deal with this, you might think that we have to build in a semantic concept of information, specifying what the sender intended the signal to mean and what the receiver took it to mean. But I want to emphasize again that in Lewis signaling games, that is not necessary. Because of the strong common interest present, the mark that information has been successfully transmitted and that we have a signaling system equilibrium is maximal payoff to sender and re receiver. As Democritus said, the word is the shadow of the act. So that is here, he's saying, with humans, we might be tempted to say, the information that you were trying to convey is what you intended the signal to mean, and the information I received is what I thought the signal meant. But we don't want to say that when we're talking about monkeys and trees, and definitely not when we're talking about algae and fungus. And yet, we can still say whether information was successfully conveyed or not, because both of these participants in the interaction have the same interest. They both want the receiver to do the thing that co corresponds to what the sender can sense. And if, they always, if the receiver always does the right thing, then we say they're successfully communicating and the meaning is shared. And uh, that's all we need to say. We don't need to think about what's going on inside their head or even if they have a head. And so here, Skirms is engaging with a kind of pragmatism or behaviorism. He's ignoring the mentalistic idea that we have to know what's going on inside, inside someone's head to understand what they mean when they do something. And that is an important contrast with many other philosophers who have thought about meaning. Okay, section three, evolution. So here he's going to tell us one way that signaling systems can emerge which is maybe what we're going to think is going on in the case of algae and fungus. They're not learning anything. They're just going to evolve towards their signaling system equilibrium. So he says here, as a simple explicit model of evolution, we start with the replicator dynamics. And he has a footnote to a paper where this is further described. It has interpretations both for genetic evolution and for cultural evolution. The population is large, and either differential reproduction or differential imitation lead the population proportion of strategy A. So P of A is going to represent what proportion of the population engage in strategy A to change as, and here he gives us a differential equation. So if you're familiar with differential equations, you might just be able to read that and see exactly what it says, that the rate of change of the proportion of the population following strategy A over time is going to be proportional to both the proportion of the population that's already following strategy A and U of A minus U, where U of A is the average payoff to strategy A and U is the average payoff in the population. So just to explain what this means for people who aren't able to just think in differential equations, imagine that we've got that population of algae and fungus and some of the algae always go into growth mode with chemical A, and some of them always go into growth mode with chemical B. And we've got a population of fungi that are in the environment, and some of the fungi always uh, signal chemical A when water is abundant, and some of them always signal chemical B when water is abundant. And we can imagine that the algae and the fungus uh, are well mixed uh, over the rocks that their spores somehow uh, come to uh, land with each other. And then what we'll find is that if there are some members of the fungus population who are following strategy A, that is they're signaling A when water is present and B when water is absent, and there are other members of the fungus population that are signaling B when water is present and A when water is absent, they are going to uh, randomly associate with algae some of those algae will go into growth mode when uh, signal A is given, and some of them will go into growth mode when signal B is given. And the idea is that uh, how well either type of fungus is going to do in the environment is going to depend on how many algae are acting in one way with respect to the signal and how many algae are acting in the other way with respect to the signal. And the idea is that if there's some number of fungi that are doing uh, signaling system A, well, the number of kids they have, the number of descendants in the next generation they have is going to be proportional to how many of them there already are. And it's also going to be proportional to 
how much better their descendants do than the descendants of the population at large. So if signaling A when water is present is more successful than signaling B when water is present, then their growth rate will be faster. And uh, uh, if signaling A when water is present does worse, then their growth rate is going to uh, be negative, actually, they'll go down. And so uh, he's going to say evolutionary dynamics is then going to operate in this way on a population of senders and a population of receivers. And in some cases, it could be that we have one population of senders and another population of receivers. That's what goes on in the case of the algae and the fungus or the tree and the monkey. The tree is never going to find itself in the position of deciding whether or not to eat the fruit. The algae is never going to find itself in the position of deciding which signal to send. But evolutionary dynamics could also operate on a single population in which individuals sometimes find themselves in the role of sender and sometimes in the role of receiver. And so to think about this, imagine, so one example in biology would be that meerkats, so meerkats are these cute animals that live in Southern Africa and uh, they, uh, they like to forage in the grasslands and they take turns where one of them is keeping watch while all the others are out foraging for food. And they all need to work together to survive as a community. And the one who's keeping watch can see if there's an eagle coming or see if there's a lion coming or see if there's no predator coming. And they've got a bunch of different sounds that they can make. Chirps, clicks, hisses, I don't know what other sign sounds they can make. And what the meerkats want to do is that if an eagle is coming, they all want to run down into their burrows and hide underground. But uh, that's not good if a lion comes because the lion can just dig up their burrow. And if a lion's coming, they all want to run up into the trees to get away from the lion. But that's no good if it's an eagle. And so, uh, sin but since the meerkats take turns, it might be that one meerkat sends a click when the eagle comes and a hiss when the lion comes, and a different meerkat sends a different signal. But they all eventually have to learn both to send that signal and to receive that signal. And that's different from the case of the monkey in the tree or the uh, algae and the fungus, where each organism only needs to learn one side of the signaling system. And for a human example, we can think of the version of the game show where you and I take turns seeing what's in the box and using the light or choosing a box after seeing the light. And uh, if we take turns, then we're probably going to Ha use the same signaling for both sides. So here, he's going to now see what happens. Consider the two population model for the simplest Lewis signaling game. Two states, two signals, two acts. That's what's going on in the algae fungus case or the tree and monkey case or the original game show where I'm always looking and you're always taking a box. And for further simplification, let's suppose the population has only senders who send different signals for the different states and only receivers who perform different acts when they get different signals. That is, we never imagine that I will decide to always push the red button regardless of what I see, or that the fungus will always use the same chemical regardless of whether water is present. So now he says, there's only two sender strategies. It could be that strategy one in state one, you send signal one. When the fruit is ripe, you say red. And in state two, you send signal two. When the fruit is unripe, you send green. Or there's signaling system S2, where in state one, when the fruit is ripe, you say green. And in state two, when the fruit is unripe, you say red. And then there's only going to be two possible receiver strategies, that when you see red, you eat. And when you see green, you don't eat or R2, when you see red, you don't eat, and when you see green, you eat. And now the pairs, S1, R1, that is sending red when ripe and eating when you see red, and S2, R2, that is sending green when ripe and eating when green, these are the signaling system equilibria. That is, these are the cases where they've coordinated their behavior well. And now the population dynamics lives on a square with the proportion of the population doing S2 on the y-axis and the proportion of the population doing R2 on the x-axis, as shown in figure one. So I've copied that figure up here. It's on the next page, which we'll see in a moment again. But here, basically what he's saying is, at any point in time, we can imagine that there are some trees that 
make their ripe fruits red and their unripe fruits green. And there are some trees that make their ripe fruits green and their unripe fruits red. And how many of there are, there are of one or the other tells us how far to the right or left on this graph uh, the, uh, the population is. And similarly, at any point in time, there are some number of monkeys that eat red fruits and leave green fruits. And there are some number of monkeys that eat green fruits and leave red fruits. And that proportion tells us uh, the up or down. And then the arrow here is going to tell us how are the evolutionary pressures on uh, these species uh, going to affect them. So for instance, imagine that we're at the bottom here. On the bottom here, in the middle of the bottom, that's going to be a case in which all monkeys eat red fruits and don't eat green fruits. But half of the trees make ripe red fruits and unripe green fruits, and half of the trees make ripe green fruits and unripe red fruits. Well, if the monkeys are always eating red fruits, then the trees that produce, that make their ripe fruits red will reproduce well, while trees that make their ripe fruits green will do very badly. And so in the next generation, the proportion of trees that, uh, uh, that make their ripe fruits red will increase. The population will move to the left. The monkey population won't change because all the monkeys are already doing the same thing. There's no way for any of them to change their strategy. They're just inheriting their strategy from their parents. And so that's what this arrows to the left along the bottom mean, that uh, how much better the, uh, that the, that the, the trees that make their fruits uh, uh, match what the monkeys are doing will do better, and the other trees will do worse. And if we look at the very top, we see the opposite, that uh, uh, that if all the monkeys are eating green fruits and leaving red fruits, then the trees that make their ripe fruits green will do better. And so the population will converge towards that. So if we're on either edge, eventually the population will get into one of these corners. But now we could also imagine a situation where we're slightly off the edge. So maybe 80% of the monkeys eat red fruits and leave green fruits, but 20% of the monkeys do the opposite. Now in this case, at first, if the trees are 50-50 one way or the other, then the monkeys, either type of monkey will do equally well. They'll each get half the food they're looking for. And so the population is just going to change in a horizontal way. But if there's an imbalance in the number of trees, if more of the trees are doing one or the other, then the monkeys that are uh, eating in the way that most of the trees are producing are going to do slightly better. And so there's going to be some amount of upward or downward motion in addition to the left or right motion. And that's what all these little arrows are shown. And so it shows if the majority of the uh, trees are one way, then the monkey population will tend to evolve downwards. That's what happens the entire left half of the graph. All of these arrows have some downwards component. And how, how steeply downwards they are is going to increase as you go farther left. It becomes horizontal in the middle, and then they're going to be all upwards as you go to the right. And then similarly, the tree population is going to be affected by the monkeys. So when all the monkeys are doing one, the arrows always point to the right. When the monkeys are all doing the other, all the arrows point to the left. And near the middle, the arrows don't have much left or right orientation to them at all. And so if we start out with a population with any mix, we can then now trace out these arrows and see how the population will tend to change over evolutionary time. And we can see anywhere that we start, if it's not immediate, exactly on this diagonal line, uh, anywhere to the upper right of that diagonal line will converge to the upper right corner. Anything that's to the lower left of the diagonal line will converge to the lower left corner. And if you're directly on that line, you'll end up in this weird unstable equilibrium in the middle where half the trees do one and half the trees do the other, half the monkeys do one and half the monkeys do the other. If there's any imbalance at all, then one population of monkeys will start doing a little bit better and then that'll make the corresponding population of trees do a little bit better and it'll gradually get sucked to one side or the other. So as he says, the two signaling systems, that is the upper right corner and the lower left corner, are the only stable equilibrium, and evolution carries almost every state of the population to either one signaling system or the other.
And now he's going to say the same thing about what happens in the one population model, like with the meerkats, where they are uh, uh, making one sound for the eagle and a different sound for the lion, and the others are running up the tree for the one signal or into the burrows for the other signal. And we can imagine a meerkat who does the same thing with when they hear a signal as the way they would send a signal, and a meerkat that does the opposite thing when they hear a signal and as when they send a signal. The ones on these two gray corners of this tetrahedron correspond to the ones doing the weird thing. Signaling system one and signaling system two correspond to the cases where they're doing the, the sort of sensible thing and uh, uh, doing the same thing when they receive a signal as when they send the signal. Now, the dynamics lives on this tetrahedron. There are four types of population, and the vertices are the dynamic equilibria. And in addition, there's a line of uh, equilibria running through the center of the tetrahedron. That is, if the population is has some perfectly even balance of people doing the weird things, then they'll be able to be stable. But again, all of the equilibria are unstable. That is, if you're just a tiny bit off of this line, you're going to end up moving to one of these corners. Those two corners are going to be the only stable equilibrium. All states to one side of the plane cutting through the tetrahedron are carried to one signaling system, all on the other side to the other signaling system. Almost every po possible state of the population is carried by mere evolution to a signaling system. We see here how a symmetric model can be expected to yield an asymmetric outcome. That is, there is nothing in the model that starts out with the idea that red has to mean ripe and green has to mean unripe, or the opposite. There's nothing in the model that says that uh, um, hiss has to mean lion and click has to mean eagle, or the opposite. Uh, but if there is some slight imbalance among the population about who's doing one and who's doing the other, then the principle of sufficient reason is defeated by their spontaneous symmetry breaking in the evolutionary dynamics a slight imbalance is going to reward the ones that go along with that imbalance and is going to punish the ones that don't. And eventually the whole population will be following the one dynamics. The population moves to a signaling system as if one might say guided by an unseen hand. Here he's referring back to Adam Smith, who we quoted at the very beginning, who says that in a market economy, uh, the producers of goods just care about their own profit but they're going to end up producing the goods that the consumers of goods happen to want. And in this case, we can think of the producers of signals and the consumers of signals as these two types of signaling system. And as if an invisible hand is pushing everyone to agree, they're going to end up agreeing. Okay, so now section four, learning strategies. So the previous section is all about what happens if it's pure evolution with no conscious thought on the part of any of the uh, uh, organisms, and also no way for an organism to change their own individual strategy. Imagine that some monkeys are just born with the gene where they find red fruits irresistible and green fruits uh, they never try to eat, and some of them are born with a gene that does the opposite. In this section, he's going to consider uh, about what happens if the monkeys can learn over the course of multiple interactions with trees to do different things. And this might be even a better model in the case of the two humans playing the game show. So now here, as a simple, explicit model of unsophisticated learning, so maybe something that we might naively think monkeys are more likely to do than humans, humans might think about what's going on in the other person's head, but monkeys might not. We start with reinforcement according to Richard Hernstein's matching law. The probability of choosing an action is proportional to its accumulated rewards. That is, we imagine that the monkey starts out with a 50-50 chance of eating a red fruit or eating a green fruit. And uh, then what it does is over time, it just says, every time I eat a green fruit, let, uh, let's see, was it good or was it bad? If it was good, I will increase my probability of eating green fruits. If it was bad, I won't do anything. Whereas if I eat a red fruit, then if it was good, I'll increase my probability of eating red fruits. And if it was bad, I will leave the probability unchanged. 
And uh, uh, here in the footnote, he mentions that this was proposed by Hernstein in 1970 as a quantification of Thorndike's law of effect, later used by other people to model experimental human data on learning and games, and by others to model chemotaxis and social bacteria, and then later to model social network formation. And maybe this is how we learn which direction to dodge when you're walking on a crowded sidewalk. I don't consciously think, should I dodge left or should I dodge right? I just automatically do one or the other. And maybe which one I do is just affected by how often doing one has succeeded and how often doing the other has succeeded. We start with some initial weights, perhaps equal, attached to each action. An act is chosen with probability proportional to its weight. The payoff gained is added to the weight for the act that was chosen, and the process repeats. As the weights build up, the process slows down in accordance with what psychologists call the law of practice. So that is, early on, if I haven't act, if the monkey hasn't actually had any fruits yet, it, maybe it's got weight one for eat red and weight one for eat green, then if it eats a good green fruit, it'll now have weight two for that and weight one for the other. So it'll have two thirds probability. It changes all the way from one half probability to two thirds probability after a single instance of learning. Whereas once the monkey has eaten 300 fruits, if 200 of the green fruits were good and 100 of the red fruits were good, then maybe the monkey now has two thirds chance of picking a green fruit. But uh, if it gets a success on red or a success on green, that's just going to change it to 201 versus 100 or 200 versus 101, which makes much less difference to the probabilities. And this is a thing that we observe, that once people have done something a lot, they don't change their uh, probability of doing it that much. So now consider repeated interactions between two individuals, one sender and one receiver, who learn strategies by this kind of reinforcement. That is, maybe imagine that you and I on the game show, we at first just randomly try the blue light or the red light, the left box or the right box. And if we happen to miraculously succeed one of these times, then we become more likely to do the same thing in that same situation. This setup resembles the two population evolutionary model, except that process is not deterministic, but chancy. That is, I'm not doing the same thing every time, I'm doing a different thing every time. And so I could possibly learn something slightly different if we were to rerun the situation over again. Whereas in the evolutionary case, we're imagining a large population and the success of any one individual depends on precisely what the size of the population is and that's deterministic. As an example, let us focus on the two state, two signal, two act signaling game of the last section in the special case in which the sender has only strategies S1 and S2 and the receiver has only strategies R1 and R2. Footnote, that is, we exclude the babbling strategies where the sender ignores the state and always sends the same message, or where the receiver ignores the message and always does the same act. You can think of this as a model of the situation in which the sender and the receiver both want information to be transmitted, but don't know each other's strategies. We can prove that reinforcement learning converges to a signaling system with probability one. Computer simulations show that learning is reasonably fast. One of the big things that Skirms and many of his followers have done is that they've actually generated computer models of these to see how many trials do you need to learn how to signal effectively? What fraction of the time does the signaling end up one way rather than another way? Okay, section five, learning actions. We helped the emergence of signaling in the foregoing model by letting reinforcement work on complete strategies in the signaling game, on functions from input to output. That is, we've just assumed that I'm either going to follow the strategy of left is blue and right is red, or left is red and right is blue. Essentially, the modeler has done some of the work for the learners. I take this as contrary to the spirit of Democritus, according to which the learners should not have to conceive of the problem strategically. So imagine the case of the algae and the fungus where we don't want them to even think, we don't want, we don't want the fungus to have to think, I will send signal A if there's water and B if there's not, or vice versa. Rather, we just want them to learn to evolve to 
When there's water, send one of them, and when there's no water, send the other. Let us reconceptualize the problem by reinforcement work on single actions and see if we still get the same result. To implement this for the simplest Lewis signaling game, the sender has separate reinforcements for each state. You can think of it as an urn for state one with red balls for signal one and black balls for signal two, and another such urn for state two. So that is, imagine that the way that the fungus works is that uh, when there's water, it sort of consults some internal randomization, and it has some probability of sending chemical A and some probability of sending chemical B. And when it encounters no water, it has some probability of sending chemical A and some probability of sending chemical B. It doesn't do anything deterministically. And then every time it succeeds in getting, every time the algae does the right thing when it has sent one of these signals, it increases the prob probability of sending that signal in that state. And every time the algae does the wrong thing, it leaves everything unchanged. <laughs> the receiver also has two urns, one for each signal received and each containing balls for the two acts. That is the algae just says, when it has signal A, it has some probability of going into growth mode and some probability of going into conservation mode. When it gets signal B, it has some probability of doing either one. Reinforcement for a successful act is like adding a ball of the color drawn to the sender and receiver earned, earned just sampled. The individuals are being reinforced for what to do on this sort of occasion. We then ask what happens when these occasions fit together to form a signaling game. It has recently been proved in this case as well that learning converges to a signaling system with probability one. So that is, we don't even have to build in that they are deterministically doing one or deterministically doing the other. We just have to allow that they can be probabilistically doing either thing in either situation. And these probabilities, if they get updated by reinforcement, will converge to determinism. OK, section six, states, acts, and signals. So in the simplest Lewis signaling games, the number of states, acts, and signals are assumed to be the same. That is, in, all the, in most of the examples I've mentioned, there are two states. Either water is present or it's absent. Either the money's in the left box or it's in the right box. Either the fruit is ripe or it's unripe. There are two acts. You can either take the left box or the right box. You can either uh, eat the fruit or not eat the fruit. Uh, uh, you can either go into growth mode or into conservation mode. And the number of signals is also the same. It's two in each case. What if there's a mismatch? There may be, and we've also got examples where there was three. So it could be there's a lion, there's an eagle, or there's no predator. There's a hiss, there's a click, there's a, uh, 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 I don't remember what the third sound was. And the behaviors are run up the tree, run into the burrow, and for, forage for food. And now what if there's a mismatch? Maybe there's extra signals. So in the case of the meerkats, it seems very likely that there are more than three sounds they could make. Or, or maybe there's too few signals. Maybe uh, maybe the, the in the game show, maybe there's three boxes, but I only have two colored lights that I'm allowed to use to communicate with you. Or maybe there's not enough acts. Maybe there are some states where there's just no good act. All of these possibilities raise questions that are interesting, both philosophically and mathematically. Suppose there are too many signals. Do synonyms persist, or do some signals fall out of use until only the number required to identify the states remain in use? That is, we could imagine that maybe the meerkats have 17 different sounds they could make. Maybe at a certain point, there are four different sounds that some of the meerkats are using to refer to lines, and there are three different sounds that some of them are using to, uh, uh, to signal eagles. Is it going to be the case that everyone keeps using all of these different signals? Or are some of the signals going to sort of uh, fall out of fashion and others take over? Uh, is it going to be the case that they converge on one as the easiest way to uh, send the information? Or are they going to persist with multiple? Uh, or suppose there are too few signals. Then there is, of necessity, an information bottleneck. Does efficient signaling involve? Do the players learn to do as well as possible? Uh, so in the case of the game show, where there's maybe three boxes, but only two lights, I'm not going to be able to tell you 
which box the money is in with the light. But maybe I could use the blue box, the blue light whenever it's in the left box and the red light whenever it's in either of the other two boxes. Or maybe I will use the blue light whenever it's in the left box and the red light whenever it's in the rightmost box and then just randomize which signal I send when it's in the middle box. Either of these is going to be a relatively efficient way to send information. And I think these are maximally efficient in terms of the probabilistic information conveyed. Do we converge to this? Suppose there are lots of states, but not many acts. How do the acts available affect how the signaling system partitions the states? If we have two states, two acts, and three signals, we could imagine that the third signal gets in the way of efficient signaling, or that one signal falls out of use and one ends, and you end up with essentially a two signal system, or that one signal comes to stand for one state and the other two persist as synonyms for the other state. Simulations of the learning process that was mentioned in the previous section, that is these computer simulations, always produce efficient signaling, often with the persistence of synonyms. Learning is just about as fast as it is in the case in which there are only two signals. So these synonyms don't disappear. If we have three states, three acts, and only two signals, there is an information bottleneck. The best that the players could do is to get it right two thirds of the time. This could be managed in various ways. The sender might use the signals deterministically to partition the states. For example, send signal one in state one and send signal two in states two or three. That is, use the blue light when it's in the left box and the red light in either of the other two boxes. An optimal receiver's strategy in reply would be to do act one when receiving signal one and to randomize between acts two and three with any probability. This identifies a line of equilibria. That is, we could imagine a signal, uh, a, respond, uh, a receiver who always picks the middle box when you get the red light, or a receiver who always picks the right box when you get the red light, or a receiver who just does 50-50 or does two thirds, one third, any of these will be equally good. Alternatively, the receiver could be deterministic. Maybe they always do act one when they get the red light, and they always do act two when they do the blue light. And if so, the optimal sender strategy to pair by this would be to always send signal one in state one and signal two in state two, and they could randomize however they want in state three. This identifies another line of efficient equilibria. Footnote, notice that these two lines share a point. If we consider all the lines of efficient equilibria, we have a cycle. That is, I think the, uh, the strategy where they both are deterministic is going to be a member, an extreme member of both of these lines of equilibria. There are, of course, also lots of inefficient equilibria. That is, if everyone's just perfectly randomly doing everything, there's not going to be any advantage to anyone in terms of uh, moving towards one of the signaling strategies. However, simulations always deliver efficient equilibria. And it turns out they're always of the first kind, where the sender acts deterministically and the receiver randomizes. Never the second kind, where the receiver acts deterministically and the sender randomizes. And that is to say, the signaling system always partitions the states. And learning is still fast. He doesn't say precisely what he means by fast in this case, but... Uh, uh, but he gets into that more in the book. If we have three states, but only two signals and two acts, we then, so that is, there's only two acts you could do. There's not one act for each state. We could say one set of payoffs might be that we both do well if you do act one in state one, we both do well if you do act two in state three, and then in state two, which uh, it, we could say that act one is a little better than act two or a lot better than act two, or maybe worse. If E is greater than 0.5, so that act two is better than act one in state two, uh, then it's best to have a signal that gets you to do act one that you send in states one and two, and the other signal sent only in state three. Oh, I think that was a typo. That was if E is less than 0.5. Now, if E is greater than 0.5, an efficient equilibrium lumps state two and three together. That is, it's just going to be, if, if it's better to do act two in state two, then I'll just always send the signal two 
uh, uh, in states two or three. The optimal payoff possible depends on E. It's going to be two thirds when E is precisely 0.5 and one if E is either zero or one. And for the whole range of values, optimal signaling emerges. Learning is just as fast as in the previous case. So here he's just showing off some of the simple results you get from actual computer simulations that he built. Section seven, signaling networks. Signaling is not restricted to the simple one sender, one receiver case discussed so far. Alarm calls, like with the meerkats, usually involve one sender and many receivers, perhaps with some of the receivers being eavesdroppers from other species. So we could imagine that there's other animals that like to forage near meerkats because they know that the meerkats will tell them if there's a predator present. Quorum signaling in bacteria, that is when bacteria wait until enough of them are present before they do something to attack the host. I believe this is how malaria works, for instance. It only causes the harm to the host once it has reproduced enough to be able to take over. Uh, quorum signaling has many individuals playing the role of both sender and receiver. The brain continually receives and dispatches multiple signals, as do many of its constituents. Most natural signaling occurs in networks. A signaling network can be thought of as a directed graph with an edge directed from node A to node B, signifying that A sends signals to B. All our examples so far have been instantiations of the simplest possible case. One sender sends signals to one receiver. And here he draws the diagram. A single sender with a dot, a single receiver with a dot, and an arrow come, going from one to the other. There are other simple topologies that are of instance, of interest. One that I discuss elsewhere involved multiple senders and one receiver. I imagine two senders who observe different partitions of the possible states. So uh, here, uh, an example of this might be, maybe there's a game show where there are four boxes and I can tell whether the money is in one of the top two or one of the bottom two Someone else can tell whether the money's in one of the left two and one of the right two, and you have to choose one of the four boxes. We're probably going to learn to, that I should use the one color to signal the top and one color to signal the bottom. The other person should use one to signal left and the other to signal right. In the context of alarm calls, if one sender observes that a snake or a leopard is present and another observes that there is no snake, a receiving monkey might be well advised to take the action appropriate to obey the leopard. Multiple senders who transmit different information leave the receiver with a problem of logical inference. It is not simply the problem of drawing a correct inference, but rather the problem of drawing the correct inference relevant to his decision problem. That is, we don't need to know which predator is there. We just need to know, should I run up or should I run down? For instance, suppose sender one observes the truth value of P, that is whether, the, uh, whether an eagle is present or whether a lion is present or whether the money's in one of the top two boxes and then sends signal A or B and sender two observes the truth value of Q, whether it's in the left, one of the left two or one of the right two, sends C or D. Maximum specificity is required when the receiver has four acts, one right for each combination of truth values. But a different decision problem might require the receiver to compute the truth value P X or Q of one act if true and do one act if true and another if false. That is perhaps we're doing in the game show, it's not that we see boxes of money, it's that I can see two cards over here. One of them has a square and one of them has a triangle. Someone else can see two cards over here. One has a square and one has a triangle. And you have to pick one card from here and one card from here and just make sure they match. So maybe I can send the red signal if it's the left one is the triangle and the blue signal if the right one is the triangle. Maybe this person sends the yellow signal if the left one is the triangle and the right signal and the green signal if the left one is the triangle. But whatever it is, we have to learn how to do that where you just, you don't care uh, which signal means what, you just have to figure out, do I take the two left, or do I take the left and the right uh, in response to the different colors of signals? 
Senders may observe different aspects of nature by chance, but they may also be able to choose what they observe. Nature may present receivers with different decision problems. Thus, a receiver might be in a situation in which he would like to ask a sender to make the right observation. This calls for a dialogue where information fl flows in both directions. Nature flips a coin and presents player two with one or another decision problem. Player two sends one of two signals to player one. Player one selects one of two partitions of the state of nature to observe. Nature flips a coin, presents player one with the true state. Player one sends one of the two signals to player two. Player two chooses one of two acts. Here, a question and answer signaling system can guarantee that player two always does the right thing. That's all very abstract, but we could imagine a game show again. So imagine that uh, uh, you know you're, there are there's four boxes out here. I can either look at the right two or I can look at the left two. You get given a choice. Maybe they bring you to the right one and you have to choose which one to do. I then have, would have to ideally run over, look at the right ones and send a signal to you that you would then act on. Or if you're being asked to choose about the left ones, then I would have to run over to the left ones, look at them and send you the signal. If I can't see where you are, then the only way I'm going to know which one to go for is if you push a button to send a light to signal to me. So maybe you've got yellow and green to say whether it's right or left, and then I've got red or blue to say whether it's top or bottom, and we have to figure out how to converge on this. Or a sender may distribute information to several receivers, as in this diagram. This might be the diagram for what's going on with like a traffic signal, where the city wants to send signals to people on the one road and people on the other road about who's allowed to go when. And we all have to converge on the idea that red means you don't go and green means you do go. But we could have converged on the opposite. It would have been fine. We just had to converge on one solution or the other. One instance is the case of eavesdropping, where a third individual listens in to a two-person sender-receiver game, with the act of the third person having payoff consequences for himself, but not the other two. That might be what's going on if you've got like deer who are grazing next to the meerkats, and they want to run away if there's a lion, but they don't care if there's an eagle. The meerkats may care about each other's survival, but the deer doesn't. In footnote 13, he says there's also more complicated forms of eavesdropping where the third party's actions have consequences for the signalers and there's conflict of interest. So uh, here, maybe if we have an eavesdropper, maybe you have to, maybe that interferes with what signaling you want to send because you want to send it in a way that your intended listener can learn to do it, but the person who's eavesdropping in a way that might harm you doesn't learn the fact that might harm you. For a fascinating instance in which plants eavesdrop on bacteria, see Bauer and Mathesius, 2004. In a somewhat more demanding setup, the sender sends separate signals to multiple receivers who then have to perform complementary acts for everyone to get paid. For instance, each receiver must choose one of two acts. The sender observes one of four states of nature and sends one of two signals to each receiver. Each combination of acts pays off in exactly one state. Signalers may form chains where information is passed along from the first to the second to the third. The second doesn't observe anything other than the signal of the first. The first observes the true state of nature, and the third is the only one who gets to do anything meaningful. The second just sends another signal. In one scenario, the first individual observes the state, signals the state. The second observes the signal and signals the third, who must perform the right act to ensure a common payoff. There's no requirement that the second individual sends the same signal that she receives. She might function as a translator from one signaling system to another. For all these networks, computer simulations of reinforcement learning show spontaneous emergence of signaling systems, although a full mathematical analysis remains to be done. It is remarkable that such an unsophisticated form of learning can arrive at optimal solutions to these various problems. That is, you don't have to assume that it's humans who are thinking about what the others are doing and thinking about how to, uh, how to communicate. All you have to assume is that if it worked once, I'll be more likely to do it again. And that's how evolution works. And that's how simple animal uh, conditioning, behaviorist learning works. And that's enough to learn 
perfect signaling systems in all these cases. These networks are the simplest examples of large classes of phenomena of general interest. They also can be thought of as modules, which appear as constituents of more complex and interesting networks that process and transmit information. It is possible for modules to be learned in simple signaling interactions and then assembled into complex networks by either reinforcement or some more sophisticated form of learning. The analogous process operates in evolution. Okay, section eight, conclusion. How do these results generalize? This is not so much a, sim a single question as an invitation to explore an emerging field. Even the simplest extensions of the models I've shown here are full of surprising and interesting phenomena. And here is a footnote to two papers by one of my other colleagues, Simon Hudiger. The dynamics could be varied. On the evolutionary side, we can move from the large population deterministic model of the replicator dynamics to a small population stochastic model. That is, we assume maybe, maybe it's not like a large number of monkeys with a large number of trees. Maybe it's a small number of monkeys, so it's just chance which ones happen to uh, be near which trees. And now uh, maybe the, the signals that are less uh, prominent in the community might just by chance happen to find the right receivers and do well. The mathematical structure of one natural stochastic model of differential reproduction is remarkably similar to our model of reinforcement learning. Or on the learning side, we could consider more sophisticated types of learning, not just mere reinforcement. One might expect more sophisticated learners, that is ones who are capable of thinking about each other rather than just increasing their probabilities when it works and doing nothing when it doesn't. You might think that more sophisticated learners can learn to signal more easily, but the matter needs to be investigated. We are familiar with phenomena where sometimes people outsmart each other when they're trying to learn to communicate and they never end up succeeding. We started with a fundamental question. Suppose we start without pre-existing meaning. Is it possible that under favorable conditions, unsophisticated learning dynamics can spontaneously generate meaningful signal? The answer is affirmative. The parallel question for evolution turns out to be not so different and is answered in the same way. The adaptive dynamics achieves meaning by breaking symmetry. Democritus was right. It remains to explore all the ways in which he was right. That is, Skirms is saying, in the end, we see you don't need any intelligence in order for communication to arise. It can arise by dumb evolution or dumb uh, reinforcement learning. And this might be the origin of all the different signaling systems that we see in nature. It might even be the origin of language. But this it remains to be seen. How can this build to anything as complex as human language? 